All right, everybody. According to my phone, it is right at 10 o'clock right now at this moment. And we're going to start this morning's presentation. Thank you all very much for joining us here for gardening on the Gulf Coast. You'll see in the chat box, if you scroll up a little bit, there's a there's a link to our YouTube page where we have all of our previous Gardening on the Gulf Coast presentations uh, recorded and housed in a online library for you to view at a later time. As soon as we get this video today edited uh, and added to that list, it'll be available for you to watch uh, anytime, day or night. So if you can't sleep in the middle of the night and you want something fun to watch, we can you can go there and, and learn everything there is to know about gardening on the Gulf Coast. Today's presentation is on turf ma maintenance. And this will be presented by Mr. Michael Potter. Mr. Potter is the County Extension Horticulturist with Texas A&M AgriLife Extension in Montgomery County and he is officed in Conroe. With nearly 15 years of extension experience, Mr. Potter has spent years focusing on turf grass management and home lawns, parks, and sports fields. Today's presentation will focus on getting your home lawn ready for fall and winter. So we're gonna cover all the bases and uh, it should be a, a great presentation, very timely on us getting our, our lawns ready for the cool season. Reminder, please, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type those questions and comments into the chat box. If you look on the page here, the arrow to the right, the red arrow on the right uh, shows the, the chat bubble. Uh, please click on that and enter those questions and comments into that spot and we will address those. We have several agents that will be wrangling questions during the presentation. And if appropriate, we will present those to Mr. Potter for further discussion as needed. Um, once again, uh, it's very important to please make sure that your mics are muted and that your video feeds are disabled throughout the complete presentation, as these do cause distractions to the presenter and to your fellow guests. So thank you very much for your attendance today. And with that, I present to you, Mr. Michael Potter. Good morning, everyone. Hope everybody's enjoying uh, somewhat a little bit cooler weather. Um, of course, with that said, you know, there's a lot of things that come with that and moving into a fall situation. Um, just a couple of things, you know, go, go back. If you, if you have your video on, uh, it tells you right there how to turn your video off. Um, right there on that bar uh, that way because I've got, I've got a little video and stuff that I'm going to show at one point in time in the presentation and uh, trying to minimize you know bandwidth itch issues um, that way everybody can see it clearly uh, is kind of a priority so uh, in fact during my presentation what I'm going to do is I, I know you don't need to see my little ugly mug down at the bottom of it so I'm going to go ahead and turn myself off uh, so you'll just have to listen to my voice um, so here we go. Let's get rolling. So I kind of, you know, wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, fall turf chores. Um, I have a little publication that I call lawn, you know, lawn chores, uh, and it goes throughout the year. So with that said, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the turf grass physiology. That way you understand um, kind of why and how turf grows. And, and it helps you better understand what happens when you uh, have issues or you know, mowing issues, whether it be, you know, too high, too low, what happens with that, uh, watering issues and fertilization issues, and some of the common lawn problems. So, and just remember that most of these things are all linked together. Uh, most of the time, you know, it's it's water can cause issues with fertilization, which cause fungal issues, and it's, it's just a tangled web. Luckily, we've been doing this long enough, or I've been doing this long enough that I can, I can pretty much, uh, solve just about anything over the internet and or through photos so but we're going to talk a little bit about the about the maintenance part of this the mowing the watering the fertilizing uh, what's coming up I don't want to do it on a year 
basis in a sense. Uh, I'm not going to talk about every weed or every fungal issue because a lot of those are are, are kind of past us at this point. I, I just kind of want to talk about the things we're going to be seeing uh, here in the future or currently seeing right now. So those resources and everything will be, you know, in the presentation. Uh, what I'll do is when at the very end of this, we'll send you out a survey. We want you to fill those out. That way we know, you know, how we're doing, what kind of things we can do better. Uh, with that, I, I will also include my presentation um, in a PDF format when I send that out. That way you can have that. So we're going to talk about some of the common lawn problems that we're experiencing, weed problems and insects as well. So a little bit about the physiology, you know, is a grass versus a turf grass. Um, you know, the biggest thing is, is there's so many different grasses out there. There's, you know, way over 500 species that grow just in Texas alone of grasses. You know, the, the difference is the turf grass survives a mowing. Um, most of these other grasses will not survive mowing. That's why we have a distinction between grass and turf grass. So looking at the, the photos here, you can kind of see, you know, how grass grows. You've got, you know, some of the different types of grasses have maybe have rhizomes or uh, runners like uh, St. Augustine. Um, you know, of course, there's always Bermuda that grows, you know, some people say from China. So, you know, it's one of those things that just kind of uh, uh, is what we have to deal with with our warm season grasses. Um, and if you, and I'll talk about, you know, a lot of people want to know how do I kill my Bermuda that's coming in my St. Augustine, and I'll talk about that later too. But you can see how turf grass grows. And, you know, most of the time when we look at turf grass, our main goal is to grow leaf matter. Um, we want that green appearance, so we want to grow leaves. Um, so that's a primary you know, component of what turf grass is. You see on the right one, you know, uh, this will come into play when we talk about some of the fungal issues that we're going to start to see. Um, if you haven't already seen them, just depending on where you are in the state, um, that I'll be able to explain to you what happens, you know, down at the node and the stem and the leaf sheath, uh, uh, how some of these funguses or even insects can attack it. First of all, a distinction, you know, I, get, I get a lot of phone calls at people that move from out of state um, and move into our area and they want to know why they can't grow Kentucky bluegrass, uh, tall fescue, annual. They want to grow all these things that are from other parts of the, the country, so to speak. Uh, we have warm season grasses in our area, typically around the Gulf Coast. That's what we deal with. And you can see on the left, those are some of the ones that are out there. Uh, most of the ones that you're going to see, of course, in lawns is St. Augustine grass primarily. Um, and then you'll see zoysia and then some Bermuda grasses, especially some hybrids um, like Tifway 419 or something like that. Um, the common Bermuda grasses you use, you know, typically in larger lawns where, um, you know, that are acre, two acres because uh, trying to sod a, a grass with a, a type of variety that's uh, the specific variety like TIFY 419 could be very costly, even though Bermuda seed is pretty costly itself. So we are dealing with warm grasses. Uh, most of your cool season grasses, you can kind of see the indication there where they are in the state. You have your warm season grasses that are they're right there along the coast and into different areas. And you can see kind of a North Texas area where we've got some uh, kind of some transition zone where there's different types of grasses. <clears throat> So um, you know, cool season, yeah, you can kind of see the growth pattern of cool season grasses versus a warm season grass. Um, and this is, a, this is a good indicator of when things need to be done, whether it be watering, fertilization, aeration, uh, top dressing. So if you look on that bottom one, it says warm season growth, it really kind of tells you when things need to be done. And I'll go into more detail in that as we kind of move along. So what's going to happen? You know, of course, when we get cold, warm season grasses go dormant. Um, and I always tell people when it comes to selecting turf grasses, how green do you want it and for how long? Uh, because there are years where even St. Augustine will go somewhat dormant. Um, especially further up north, uh, it'll it'll turn, you know, maybe 70 or 80 percent, you know, dormant, still have some green in it, but still dormant. 
Um, the um, OK, so Zoysia, uh, that's another one that can go dormant as well. Centipede and Bermuda. I see that somebody's having problems viewing the presentation. I, I think it's pretty much up. You may want to just log out and then log back in and see if that helps. OK, so, you know, Bermuda is one of those that that uh, that one of those as well that, you know, depending on the year, it, it may go somewhat dormant and have maybe 50 percent. So, you know, if all else fails and you want it green, just paint it. You know, that's what some people do. Um, I was watching a show where they were doing a renovation of a home and and the grass was they, they were supposed to have an auction. and They were worried about the grass and wanted to show it. Uh, sh show the house a little better. So they went out and actually painted the lawn. And there's all kinds of dyes and stuff that they can use nowadays to do that, but uh, just to, it's not something I would recommend. So let's talk a little bit about the maintenance aspects of the mowing, the fertilizing, and the watering. Um, I always call it a vicious cycle, especially when it comes to the spring and summer. The more water you get, the more you're going to fertilize, the more you're going to mow, and 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 vice versa. So it's just kind of a vicious cycle. Um, but balance is the key uh, with just about everything that we do and, you know, soil pH, it can affect, you know, what kind of fungus you get. It can affect nutrient uptake. Um, also, you know, the, of course, that a good balanced nutrient uh, is good. We always recommend, of course, getting soil tests and I'll go over that here in a minute. Um, optimum water availability, you know, different soils. You know, when you have a real sandy soil and the water just filters right through and you, there's not much you can do about it, you have to water more often. Um, however, you know, there's things that you can do to increase moisture holding capacity of your soils, especially the sandy soils, um, by, you know, adding organic matter before you ever put a lawn down and such. Um, you know, most time in clay soils, uh, that actually has a benefit because there's moisture there that's held longer because of a deeper pore space. So your grass may have, if, as long as you have a good root system, may be able to withstand uh, drought a lot better. And you have to have the adequate sunlight. Um, if you have, you know, four to five hours of direct sun and the rest of it shade, uh, you're not going to be able to grow Bermuda grass in the shade. Just simply put, the thinner the leaf blade, the less, um, less uh, shade that it can withstand. So eight hours is better for most of those turf grasses. That's why they're called warm season turf grasses. Um, good soil structure, you know, I, we always say in extension, we wish we could tell these builders and people say if they're going to ever do a turf grass, if they do it right from the beginning, it would last forever or at least be a lot healthier. Uh, they've even shown where there's, uh, if you you mix the soil proper and it properly and everything, you can actually reduce water runoff into you know non pervious areas which you know drains and into creeks and everything else you can actually absorb more moisture so in a sense if it was done on a large scale you could actually reduce flooding possibly in some areas or at least minimize it um, you know appropriate mowing height just depending on your turf grass and i'll go over that as well and just overall good water quality and, and soil. So if, if you're on a well system, you know, we always kind of recommend that you do a, a water test on that. So Liebig's Law of Minimum, kind of one of those things that, you know, if you have something that's that's holding you back, it's one of those pickets, uh, your, your, your grass will never quite get to its full potential. Uh, so that's why, you know, kind of need to keep these things in check. So let's talk about the mowing frequency. Uh, of course, you know, we always talk about the one third rule. Don't mow any more than one third of the leaf blade off at one point in time. Um, you know, the shorter the grass, the more frequently after the mow. The biggest thing is, is that with root systems, the higher you mow, the better the root system is to, to maintain itself through droughts and, and through those situations. Um, the biggest thing about what's coming up is that turf grass is going to slow down as its growth. So there's a couple of things with that. We're going to notice that all of a sudden we get a cold front or two, soil temperatures start to decline, and then we start to have to mow maybe every week and a half rather than almost twice a week or almost once a week. We're spreading it out a little further. Um, and, and that's something to, to recognize, especially when you get into winter, the lawn may not need to be mowed, 
but you have a lot of leaf debris and everything that are that's out there that would be good to mulch up with a mulching mower, especially if you have a mulching mower. And if you don't, you have a side discharge mower or something like that, you can always run over the, the discharge several times uh, and that, that'll cut those uh, leaf blades up smaller to where they filter down into the grass and become um, nutrients for your soul, for your soil and for your uh, grass. But here's some of the, the, the mowing heights as far as different types of uh, Bermuda grasses and, and all the different types of warm season grasses. And you can see St. Augustine grass uh, anywhere from about two and a half to four inches. Um, typically, you know, we're seeing any most lawns anywhere from three to four inches. Uh, we really don't see very many two and a half inch lawns uh, mow down to two and a half inch lawns much anymore. And, and the reason why is because of scalping. If you mow too low, you may damage runners and things like that, which open the turf grass up for more susceptible issues of insects and disease problems. So you can kind of see there that that uh, all the different types of uh, mowing heights that are that are there. And I just kind of want to go over this again. You know, taller grass equals deeper root system. You know, when as we look through the year, we always kind of tell you tell people you know kind of ramp up. You know, you, you kind of start low in the spring in a sense. Um, and then you kind of move in the summer, you keep raising that mower up and everything, you know, as those leaf blades are, are, are long, it actually shades the ground. So you'll get less, you know, evapotranspiration that occurs uh, and it kind of helps with the cooling effect of the soil. So you maintain some more moisture and then plus the other added benefit of having those longer root systems, because the longer the leaf blade, the more roots have to be there in order to sustain it. Um, so then in the fall, you know, you can start maybe, you know, bringing that mower down a little bit. Um, the, the biggest problem with leaving a summer lawn length and leaving it that length into the fall when we start getting cold fronts is it's more susceptible to large patch uh, and some of the other cool season fungal issues just because it doesn't have good airflow. So bringing it down or at least keeping it mowed often uh, will help with airflow and and keep minimize some of those other issues. So the good thing about you know taller grass that typically keeps weeds down um, as far as you know competition uh, and of course always sharpen your blades. Uh, there's uh, you can see on the left hand side there with that ripped piece of turf grass that right there has a lot of water that's being lost after it's mowed. Um, and so then if you have a clean cut, you're losing less water. I mean, if you've ever seen, you know, you cut a, a plant that has milky, uh, milky interior, if you snap it, you know, the milk comes out of it. Same concept. If, when you cut a piece of grass, water comes out. So you always want to make sure that you uh, have good sharp blades. And that's something some people like to do themselves or sometimes they just take it to somebody to do. So food for thought, I guess, from this standpoint, when it comes to the mowing, you know, clippings, if you have a mulching mower, that's really good, or, or if you can at least cut those uh, leaf blades down to smaller sizes, you at least look from the simple fact that that's going to be fertilizer for your lawn, and it can actually reduce fertilization up to one year uh, for at least one time per year. And I know like up here, you know, we do have more, more of a fall season with, um, with our trees and oak trees and such and so sometimes I, I find myself mowing even though the lawn doesn't need it but I'm going to mow anyway because I want to mulch up those leaves and use utilize those leaves as as a fertilization in fact that's for me that's my only form of fertilization I don't fertilize my lawn um, and I don't water too so that that's just going to be different just depending on where you are <clears throat> but uh, if you have non-mulching mower you know you got to make sure that you're not cutting off especially too much at one time because if you do that what's going to happen is you're going to shade out the grass underneath with that you know all your discharge uh, so make sure you go over it again so it will decompose faster because if you don't what's going to happen is you're going to either build up thatch or you're going to you know leave that on top and you're going to kill your grass so you just want to make sure you're not mowing more than that one third so let's talk a little bit about watering um, you know what to expect and you know, warm season grasses, they grow during the warm season. And, and when I talk about fertilization, this is also going to kind of come into play. So you can see, you know, uh, kind of depending on where you are in the state too, it, the, the temperatures uh, will vary. 
Uh, but for the most part, you know, when you're looking here, like in our area around the Montgomery County, uh, Harris County, Walker, Waller, uh, surrounding counties around us, you know, typically around April 15th, tax day, is a great time to think about watering. Um, typically, we will have a little bit cooler, you know, and cooler temperatures uh, during the early spring, late winter, early spring. And so you don't get as much evaporation. And plus we get, you know, cold fronts and stuff that comes through and drops water. It's not to say that you don't need to water during the winter time because sometimes you may just need to just because we're having a warmer winter than usual uh, and the grass looks like it needs it. Um, but there's ways to check for that and I'll kind of go over that here in a second. So warm season grasses, you know, they start to grow there, you know, about April, they start to kind of kick in for our area. Uh, when you look, you know, all the way down to Corpus Christi, um, shoot, you, you may not even have a winter. Um, some years uh, you may be growing and mowing straight through it. I, when I lived down in Corpus Christi, Cal Allen area, I remember years where I was mowing during the wintertime and, and sometimes once a week. So it does happen, just depends on where you are. <clears throat> but, you know, sometimes the fact is irrigation just needs to be turned off. Um, I, I think most of the extension agents would agree that, you know, we always kind of giggle about things and, you know, uh, you go down the road and it's raining and the irrigation system is going off. Um, I, it happens in my subdivision. It's, it's like a pet peeve of mine. Uh, in fact, when I first got into the job up here in Montgomery County, they asked me um, since I was a turf specialist and, you know, yeah, turf was my deal. We we're driving down the road with my boss at the time and he said, Michael, what are you going to do about that? And he points to a house and it's raining and their irrigation's going off. And I just, it's, you know, one at a time. That's all I can do. Find the off button um, or, you know, install rain sensors uh, when it does rain that it shuts that system down. Um, they, they're all different as far as that's concerned. So, you know, when it comes to the dormant season, you have to think about warm season turf grasses. They're warm season for a reason, is what I like to say. So they go dormant. They start to slow their growth down. So when they do that, they're not utilizing the same amount of moisture that they're utilizing during the heat of the summer. Of course, you're not losing to evaporation at that point, but they just they slow down their growth, so they don't need as much moisture. So just remember that. And, and we have uh, lots of different uh, venues here around Montgomery County with uh, San Jacinto River Authority, Lone Star Groundwater, and some of these other places. They'll actually send out email blasts that say, "Turn off time to turn off your irrigation system. Uh, and I've, I've even created a chart for our, our county that has that kind of information on it as well. And, and depending on where you are in the state, guys, you know, check with your extension agents because they'll kind of know the timing difference. You know, you know, I can pretty much handle a little bit in my area and around my area. But, you know, if you're way down in Corpus Christi, you know, he'll know uh, Mr. Gibbs down there. He'll he'll know more about, you know, what's going on at what time. So check with your local extension offices, too. So, you know, one of the best things to do is do an irrigation audit, uh, especially in the fall. It's a good time to do one uh, in because you're fixing to have to uh, uh, go ahead and put that system to rest, especially in some of the areas where we do get freezes or when we do get freezes. If you're using an irrigation system, you'll have to uh, shut those down and drain them. And boom, that was one of the things I thought about. We should do a class just on that. So um, we should probably do one here pretty soon, probably in you know November or something. Yep, I agree too. But uh, one of the things you can do, you know, check your system and it's good to check it several times during the year. Make sure that your zones are spraying properly. Uh, make, you know, make sure they're hitting the right spots because sometimes we create issues, even though irrigation systems are created perfectly on paper, they don't necessarily function that way in real life because of pressure, because of the number of heads, because of wind, because of other things like that. So, you, you know, look at those things, check them. Uh, just recently, uh, we had a rent house that I thought there was no irrigation at the back of the property and come to find out there is. The problem was it never functioned. Uh, so when we finally got a tenant out of there, I went over there and lo and behold, I had to replace the, uh, the electrical component of the, uh, of the, uh, the valve. <clears throat> and so now it's actually getting water when it wasn't before. So now the yard looks a lot better, of course. 
but um, having that irrigation on it, catching that water, finding out how much you're putting out in a certain time frame, and just remember that during the growing season, turf grass only needs one inch of water. And I got a guy that I work with. He's um, he's an engineer by trade, so he's really good about sending me information. He takes great notes. He actually did his own uh, irrigation audit. Uh, I provided the catch cans to him just just because it was you know very early in my career here in Montgomery County. And I said, hey, you know, why don't, why don't let's let's work through the process and let's see how you're you're doing. And I've I've been using him as a test subject for uh, oh about oh gosh eight years now. So he occasionally will send me his information. All right. So what happens with different levels of hydration as far as your water is concerned? Um, you know, stress when you get below that one inch mark, which will depend upon your root system and your soil and some other things like that, you can have some, you know, some little things that may occur, some discoloration probably. Uh, you kind of lose some of your pest resistance. Um, you get leaf firing, which, you know, uh, you go out there and do a step test. If you can walk across 20 paces and you see your, uh, through your grass and you can, you turn around and you can still see your footprints all the way to you, that grass probably needs a little water. Um, I always watch for leaf firing. I, I don't discriminate. I think brown's the color too, especially in my lawn. I like that. I, it, it tells me that that's when it needs water. I don't want to do it too early because a lot of times I've been out there and I've been, you know, ready to go ahead and turn the irrigation on, but there's a rainfall event coming in the next day or two or something like that. So I can get it you know, get it through a couple more days before I get a good rainfall because let's face it, the water out of the faucet is not as good as what Mother Nature provides. Um, just remember, you know, that, that water that we're putting out there out of that faucet is for drinking, unless you have well water, of course, but the best water for your yard is typically what comes out of the clouds. And so um, most of the times you'll have this, you know, severely damaged or dead, you know, once you get a really bad uh, drought or something like that, or it hasn't been watered, uh, typically, we'll get people that go out of town for two weeks or three weeks and they come back and their lawn is dead. Uh, it's because it just didn't have the water to begin with or they never established the lawn properly to begin with that, so it would have good adequate root systems. Just remember, it's better to water more less often. You want those root systems to chase water as it goes down into the soil column. Um, but like I said, with sandy soils, it gets to be a much uh, different situation. <clears throat> So a lot of times what I deal with up here is uh, beyond the optimum. Um, we get about 50 some odd inches of rain up here year on average. Um, <laughs> it, it's one of one of those things that uh, overwatering can also cause, you know, rooting problems, you fungal uh, lack of fungal resistance, pest resistance issues. Um, you, you basically smother the grass. Just remember roots have to have oxygen. <clears throat> All right, so and I, I think with that said, you know, there's a time frame which we're going to turn off the water for the season uh, for the most part. Like I said, further south you are, you may have to just kind of water, you know, maybe maybe it's once once a month. I see a question coming up. What is leaf firing? Leaf firing is when, OK, you have green grass and then all of a sudden there is a tan or brown piece of grass that appears. Uh, it's an indicator that, OK, something's wrong. Um, and it, and it can it, it depends if you know your lawn and you know it's requiring water and you start to see little brown leaves here and there that's leaf firing um you have to be careful because when you move into the fall then there's things that appear to be leaf firing which are not which will kind of distinguish those here in a bit so fertilization um the gentleman that i've been working with for quite a while uh he he sends me his soil test reports and of course i always have to go through these with people um from time to time, uh, you know, he's got 6.2 pH. You can see right there at the top, he's got nitrate one, oh wow, low nitrogen. Why is that, you know, oh, that's turf grass. Well, yeah, typically when, you know, you think about it, nitrogen is the element that is most required by turf grass for that green growth. So the fact is, is that especially in the fall, when you take that sample, or if you take a sample in the fall, you may have low nitrogen levels. Um, it's not uncommon. 
<clears throat> phosphorus and potassium, and those are some of the elements that are that are kind of issues. Uh, they build up in soils, especially higher pH soils. Uh, you, you can always have, um, especially, uh, you know, 7.8, 8.2, 8.4, like down in South Texas, you have high phosphorus issues. <clears throat> um, but typically, like in our area, we look at about a 3-1-2 ratio. Uh, it just depends on your area. My, my biggest thing is always get a soil test done and start a basically a fertility management plan. And, and remember, that's not something you do in one year and it's done. This is something you look over the long term. And, and that's how I evaluate and do my lawn. Um, leave a big hole in your grass. Uh, yes, uh, there are some recommendations. We'll kind of uh, there's actually information on the soil test forms on how to take those soil tests properly. There's also soil probes depending. There you go. Thank you. Boom. You're on it. Um, there's also soil probes that some of the extension offices actually do have where they all, all they take is like a core out of the soil, uh, but you'd have to do multiple of those uh, around a lawn to make sure you get a good representative sample. I think that would be a that would be a good class to hold as well for us. Um, so pH, you can see in here how it influences uh, plant availability of nutrients. You know, as you move up, there's things like down in Corpus. One of the things we had a large big problem was iron chlorosis uh, because of our high, pH, high pHs. Um, it just iron's not readily uh, absorbed or taken into the root system by plants. So you had to either provide some type of liquid and, and because of the structure of a clay soil, it binds iron. So you have to be careful with that. So iron is one of those that, that in, in, in the clay soils, it can be a problem. So you have to apply it maybe um, through liquid type fertilizers, through leaves that are um, those types of fertilizers. Um, they're called chelates. So it's put sprayed on the leaves and it enters the plant that way. And I have some cool stories about some stuff that they used on sorghum down there. I could make my yard green just by playing it, putting that stuff on it. But um, it's not a readily available. <clears throat> uh, it depends. OK, so soil test typically if they say add sulfur um, it, and this one actually doesn't say to add. Oh, well, it does say a little bit of sulfur. That's kind of the moderate level um, to me. My personal opinion is you could add a little bit if you wanted to. I just don't think it's really needed uh, like in this situation. <clears throat> um, Typically, they would like to see the soil pH a little less, uh, but that's actually adequate. Um, and it is a required element. Thank you, Ginger. Awesome. So it is a required element. So you can see once it drops below that critical limit, basically, that's when they start having recommendations on that. And you'll actually have like uh, different plants have different requirements for those elements. <clears throat> so. Nutrient management tips, you know, soil test regularly. I say every two to three years. Um, I have people that that are about every two to three years they'll do it. They'll send it to me, and what we've done is uh, come up with a management plan for them, saying, okay, this is a, you know, because you a lot of times you can't get the exact fertilizer that's recommended in a soil test. You just can't. So you kind of have to, I guess, have fudge factors in a sense and try to get as close as you can, but then have a different amendments or you'll be able to split it up. So, you know, work with your county extension agents when you get those soil sample, soil sample test results back and then we can kind of come up with plans to help you get to where you need. But the whole thing is, um, you know, every two to three years, especially if you're real deficient in something, uh, that way you can kind of figure out where you're going um, and, and what's if, you, if what you're doing is adequate and it's making it, you know, get to where you need to go. Hope that's clear. OK, so I don't uh, for most of the turf grass issues, I do not like to seed about one to two pounds of nitrogen per thousand square feet twice a year. Um, basically, the reason why is there's a lot of fungal issues and timing and, you know, you don't want to apply fertilizer at certain times because of stress and everything else. Um, you know, in some areas where the pH is real high, you might want to use those iron products. I know that I took a big bag of ironite when I was down in the uh, corpus and I put it in a yellow spot in my yard that had iron chlorosis and it never turned it green and it's because it was bound up by the clay so I had to use a chelated form of iron which is a spray uh, to actually get it to green up and so with that said 
you know, when you have those high pHs, sometimes a sulfur or even a specific fertilizer is recommended to decrease that soil pH. Like for instance, down in Corpus Christi, most of the time they see down there a 2100 recommendation uh, as far as a fertilizer, and the, uh, which is ammonium sulfate, which has the sulfate ion in it. And then once the, the ammonium's released, it kind of creates an acidic appearance to, or acidic approach to it. So, but most of the time it's, it's, it's hard to change what you already have as far as pH. I think, uh, I think at one point in time, uh, when I was down there in Corpus, the county extension agent told me that uh, it takes about a ton of sulfur to change the pH 1.0. And, and the next comment was, your neighbors will not like you. So be careful, you know, do things over time. Don't try to change things immediately. Um, recycle your clippings. That's the best thing you do. It can cut your fertilization down by half. And I've been in my house now for, you know, seven and a half, eight years. That's all I've ever done. And my lawn is just as healthy as anybody else's. Uh, vibrant does does what it, you know, I expect it to do in a sense. And I, you know, I, I control it. It doesn't control me or my pocketbook either. So, so cutoff dates, you know, for, for nitrogen, you know, we're, we're looking at right now, you can see, you know, depending on where you are in the state, um, you know, I like to tell people, you know, October 1st, October 15th is probably about the last time to do a, an application for fertilizer. Um, I will get into weed and feeds later. I don't want to get into that now, um, but just remember this is the time to fertilize. Um, and we always, I always kind of say, you know, sep September uh, is time to put a, you know, pre-emergent out, uh, late September, uh, early October. That way you can start getting kind of a jump on those uh, early weeds. And I'll, and I'll go into more detail here in a minute. But you can kind of see um, you need about six weeks of, um, you need about six weeks of growth before a stress occurs, uh, before you apply fertilizer. And here's the simple fact. If you go and apply a fertilizer too late and the, and the grass is growing slowly, that nutrient is that you applied is not going to be utilized. It's going to be, it's going to go right past the root system because the grass is not picking it up. So you've in a sense wasted money. And that's one of our jobs in extension. We're, we're here to save you money too. So make sure you apply at the appropriate times, you know, check with your extension agents in, in your local area. Uh, and just remember, it changes from year to year. Uh, it never fails. You know, that like last year, last year was real mild. You know, we had an early cold front in October up here. Looked like things were going to cool down, but then it heated right back up and then it kind of stayed that way in a sense. Um, and, and typically, uh, like I said earlier, you know, for us up here, I always say application after about April 15th. Uh, and that's when the grass is actively growing and it will be absorbing the nutrients. Otherwise, you're going to be not utilizing it. You're going to be basically throwing money down the drain and and that, you know, creates runoff and other issues like that. So the whole take home with this of fertilization, if you do too little, you'll have poor growth. It, it also encourages disease and in insects, you know, same thing with water. Uh, if you do too much, it grows too fast. It encourages and it encourages diseases and insects as well. So you got to be careful with those things. So here's kind of a representation of what a slow release fertilizer looks like versus a um, like an ammonium sulfate there on the top right. Um, ammonium sulfate, you know, once you take it, open the bag out, it starts losing. I think um, there was a study that we did back when I was in college that. You know, right when you take it out of the bag, you throw it on the top of the soil, you lose 50% of its nutrient potential pretty much, uh, and it evaporates through the air and such. So, you know, we kind of recommend uh, slow release type fertilizers They because we have warm season grasses as opposed to cool season grasses, which have like a, a double growth throughout the year. Um, so the warm season grasses, you know, providing nutrients for a longer period of time, uh, thus reducing a lot of uh, issues. And, and one of the things is, is that when you use up there on the top right, when you use high nitrogen fertilizers, you have to be careful because it is a stress. Uh, and especially if you have fungal issues, if you've had take all root rot or if you've had gray leaf spot or uh, large patch, those types of things, you want to be careful and probably stay away from these types of things. So you don't have to um, 
so you don't make an explosion of fungal issues. Um, the uh, so it actually will increase the fungal growth and everything. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. So you have to be careful about when you apply. And um, that's one of the things that um, that's kind of cool. Uh, here's a uh, area calculators .com. Uh, That's a website that um, I sometimes get phone calls in and people don't know how how much to apply on their lawn. Well, the first thing you got to do is find out how big is your lawn and they don't know. Well, that actually uses like a Google Maps and you can outline your property and you can actually figure out about how much uh, square footage your lawn is, uh, which is kind of cool. And then, of course, the website there is soiltesting.tamu.edu so you can get soil tests done. And this is an example of a, um, of a, of a particular type of uh, fertilizer uh, that's used for like rotary spreaders, you know, probably a little bit, you know, a little bit bigger than what most people would use. Um, I, I, I clipped this out from on the bottom. I clipped that fertilization chart it's out of the, uh, the the sheet that I have made over the years for here. We typically recommend just a general recommendation, a 3-1-2 ratio. This kind of lets you know how much of a particular type of uh, fertilizer you would need to apply per thousand square feet to make one pound of nitrogen. Um, so with like a 3-1-2 uh, ratio, well, the analysis on the bag shows kind of like this one up here. It'll actually show a 624. Um, that takes about 16 pounds to make one uh, pound of nitrogen. Um, so, and you can see as the analysis changes to a higher levels, you can see that the application rates decrease just basically because it's higher percentages of the nutrients that are available. Uh, down at the bottom of 21714. It's 21% nitrogen, 7% uh, phosphorus, and, and then 14% potassium. So, and typically what your recommendations are, are going to come, you're going to want to stay more towards the nitrogen side uh, of your soil test recommendations um, and, and kind of still this. Yes, the slides will be available. I will send those out with the survey. Um, sorry, Boone, I'm, I know I'm I'm killing your guys part of it by just I'm sitting here looking at I got two screens on my computer, so I'm able to see it all. So <laughs> it's kind of makes it fun. Um, so application rates, you know, just be careful. <laughs> um, make sure you're doing it right. Uh, Dr. Chalmers, who was one of our, our turf specialists years ago, said he his, he watched his neighbor uh, come home with almost a pallet of turf grass for a very small yard. Um, you know, he never measured his yard and he was going to apply the whole thing um, at one time. So you have to be careful. You need to measure your lawn, find out how many square feet it is, and then also understand that, you know, here's the here's how to figure out how much needs to be applied. And if you need help, call the extension office. We'll be glad to help you, I'm sure. And so the master gardeners as well. App application, it's, it's very important to apply appropriately and, and accordingly. Uh, if you, you can see here, Somebody did not do a very good job of applying. Uh, they didn't overlap. They didn't do things they should have done. So you get, you know, bright green and lime green in between. So you can definitely tell that somebody misapplied there. We recommend that if you're going to apply it like that, that you do it in half the amount in one direction, uh, zigzagging back and forth, and then also half the amount in the other direction. Uh, zigzagging back and forth and you should get better coverage, whether it be a drop spreader or a, um, well, with drop spreaders, you can just make sure you overlap a little bit on the sides, but with a, especially with the uh, centrifugal force one, uh, you'll want to make sure that you do this kind of pattern. All right, so uh, most of the guys that know me know that I can go probably four hours on turf grass, so I've really tried to condense a lot of these things today just to make it to where, you know, I could get you kind of a head start when it comes to fall uh, fall components and what needs to be done. <clears throat> so everything is connected, uh, you know, everything you do, mowing, the watering, the fertilizing environment, uh, the type of turf grass, it's all connected. So there's so many things that and factors that contribute to uh, like weed problems or fungal problems. You know, if the grass is stressed, you have more weed problems. 
If you have too much shade, you have more you know, weed problems, the grass thins out. So there's a lot of things that are all connected. Um, and I think that's one of the things that I'm pretty good at is understanding everything that's going on, especially in the environment in our county, um, that I can pretty much figure something out. And I can tell you, okay, by the way, we just had a cold front. We might see some isolated spots of brown patch or a large patch uh, just because the temperatures drop down below 70 degrees. They were, you know, 68, maybe 65 in some areas. Uh, trees may be an area where that may have happened. So there's micro environments that can occur. And um, so you've got to just kind of pay attention to that and, and, and pay attention to your area. And if you, like I said, if you had any questions answered, you know, your, your extension agent or your master gardener organization, those guys do a great job. So a lot of things, you know, high pH, low pH can cause problems, fertility imbalances as well, water issues, whether it be drought or oversaturation, soil compaction, drainage problems. Uh, I'd see a lot of drainage issues, uh, especially in our neck of the woods with as much rain as we get. Bad mowing heights, um, you know, excessive shade, high salinity possibility. Uh, with some of the different types of grasses. Uh, Dr. Youngkey Joe, one of our our turf pathologists, put this together quite a few years ago. Um, it, it's kind of it's something that I use for our master gardeners to help kind of diagnose things. Um, you know, I diagnose things a little differently. I do it seasonally. I know that there's certain things that occur in the summer when they start to occur, and there's a pattern to everything. So my troubleshooting skills are kind of similar to this, but this is a good way to kind of figure out what's going on. Um, you can see on the, you know, grub damage, chinch bug damage as well on here, uh, frost injury on the uh, Bermuda grasses. We, every year we have a plot out here that the uh, celebration uh, that we have, and we get a little bit of frost injury and it looks cool because it has kind of like a brain pattern to it. Um, but then, you know, you get some slime molds. In fact, we've had some, because we've had some recent rains, we've gotten some slime molds that have come in uh, you know, pictures of slime molds with all these little little balls and stuff on the grass, and they're like, what is this? Uh, one of the ones right now that we're seeing the result of uh, is take all root rot, uh, they're also called take all patch as well. Typically what happens is the grass starts to turn like a little yellow or lime green. You know, you really can't do anything to stop it. It starts to thin out. As it thins out, it becomes, um, I almost want to say dwarf. It doesn't look healthy. It looks small, looks dwarfed. Uh, and also you start getting a lot of uh, runners that are just across the top of the ground on bare ground. Um, and, and so that's what you kind of end up with. And you can see, um, you can see here where there are, you can see the turf up in the top that's damaged. It's, it's very small. It, it looks dwarf. It does not look healthy. Um, so yeah, there's a question, uh, many mushrooms in my lawn. What does that indicate? You know, it indicates you have a high level of organic matter for number one, number one. Um, and the whole thing is, is that removing them would be a good, a good thing. And then Boone right there, hit it right on nail on the head. There's a publication for you. Thank you, Boone. So here's take all root rot and kind of what it looks like. Um, you know, up under a microscope. I, I typically will put uh, samples up under a microscope and, and look at them just in case. Uh, you can see here the fungal mats that occur, and basically what happens as this fungus grows, it it the film it, it kind of penetrates the outside of the runners and it clogs up the system that's moving nutrients and water through it. <clears throat> so that's when it gets to be, you know, it, it can sit there and it can cover that. It covers the roots and, and all kinds of stuff. So the biggest thing with fungicides, I get a lot of people say, well, I sprayed a fungicide and nothing happened. Yep, you're right. Nothing happened. Um, I had a gentleman that fired three companies in a row because they couldn't do anything to his lawn. Um, they sprayed fungicides, nothing happened, so I fired him. I asked for, then another company came in and it was like within about four months that that happened. Uh, come to find out what I when I'd actually gone out and gathered more information because it was a commercial company that called me. What had happened, they had it was a newly sodded lawn, which is a no no. You don't put anything on a newly sodded lawn. You let it go for a year at least to get established. But they had the, all three companies had put in pre emergence on those lawns. And what had happened is that I could literally pick up the grass 
grab like grab grabbing hair picked it up and we had about a 10 by 10 area that would just lift right off the ground about a foot and a half and what it was is all the root systems were clubbed they didn't they weren't able to penetrate the soil because there had been so many applications of pre-emergence so um, that was not the case but you know he was blaming the fungicide there's a fungus issue there's a fungus issue well it's not um, the only thing a fungicide can do is help slow the spread of it or at least slow down the the movement or be a preventative um, that's that's about the only good that they do they can be a preventative so they have to be applied prior to seeing symptoms or prior to the excessive growth of, of the of that fungus so um, peat moss was a they they used this uh, finely ground peat moss uh, many years back on a uh, on some golf courses uh, studying take all patch um, they used fungicides this and uh, some combination products but the peat moss really seemed to have a lasting approach to it we've had good luck with it here in montgomery county um, as long as it is is spread properly uh, peat moss is only applied at about an eighth of an inch uh, it's just a light dusting. Uh, typically, I, I recommend you know people apply them just in and around the areas where they're starting to see the symptoms. Uh, most of the time, what happens though, if take all patches basically take in a big area, it's going to take too long for most homeowners to be comfortable with. So they till up those areas, they get them all ready. Um, you don't need to apply anything at that point, um, but you know just establishing the grass making sure it stays healthy will keep it at least resistant to some degree to it and if you start seeing symptoms you just treat the areas and and out beyond the areas where you're starting to see those symptoms so there are you know of course there's publications on that that i think uh yeah boone already posted that large patch aka used to be called brown patch they I always kind of make the joke that a graduate student decided that they were going to get some money and they were going to change it. But actually what I found out was there are two different strains of Rhizoctonia species that are out there. It's like strain one and strain two. Uh, one of them is for uh, one of them is for cool season grasses, which is your brown patch, and one of them is for large patch. And the bad thing is we can get both. But the good thing is, is that the treatments are all pretty much the same. <clears throat> you would have to actually culture the the fungus and everything to figure out which one you have. Uh, the picture on the left is actually my front yard. Um, years ago when we first moved in, um, you could see a circular patch. Well, right there is a low spot. So it starts like that. It's kind of a ir circular to irregular patches. It starts off small. That's why they called it large patch. It moves from small, medium to large. That's kind of a joke. I hope you all got that. All right, so leaf blades are easy to pull up or separate from the meristem. OK, so you remember that very first picture up there when we talked about some of the, the turf grass and where it grows from. That fungus actually gets right there in the crevice of that growing point and rots that that area. So that's where you start to get the leaf, the outer sheath leaves start to die. And when they do, then you can go basically go walk right up and pull on it. If you tug on it and it comes right off because it, it's mushy. That's what happens. It makes it mushy. That's large patch. So I have a neighbor across the street from me. Um, this is a prime example. Prime example. Of what happens when you fertilize at the wrong time. He had had issues with um, <laughs> with the large patch prior to this. Um, and uh, so what happened is we had a cold front or two and then his guys came through and fertilized. And so it took his whole lawn. And I mean, this was just a minor one. The funny thing was we were sitting out there talking and he looks at my lawn. He looked at his lawn and he goes, what's wrong with my lawn? And by the way, that's my lawn on the right bottom. So my lawn looks fine. And the biggest thing with large patches, it, it likes cool conditions, moisture. OK, of course, it already has its host. It's already present in all of our lawns and it can do it, it can do the same thing in Bermuda grass as well. So it's already present. It's whether the grass is susceptible to it or not. So you have control over the water for the most part. 
uh, and the fertilization. So you got to make sure that you're doing the right things in order to alleviate that. Most of the time when I have people that say, you know, I've had a big problem with a brown patch or large patch, uh, I put them on a different regimen as far as when they fertilize, what they even use as far as fertilization, just to alleviate some of those issues. And I can tell you like um, with that, that low spot, I've already filled that in. I put sandy loam in that area, just a sandy loam soil, filled it in to get rid of the low areas because low areas will typically trap moisture and hold moisture for longer, which makes it more susceptible. And by the way, that is winter time. And you can see my lawn versus my neighbor's lawn. Um, they have a lot more compaction and uh, they do a lot more fertilizing than I do. But for some reason, my lawn's a little bit greener. So um, and it, it's supposed to be dormant at that point. So it's just some of the things that you can do uh, to help get rid of it. You know, just remember, you know, when nighttime temperatures drop in the 50s and 60s, I've seen some isolated incidences where it, you know, we dropped into like 65, 60, you know, about 68 degrees, but yet there might be some micro environments um, that may have caused it. Uh, had a lady that had very large acreage, um, company called out and said, I got the, or sent me pictures and I, I said, yep, that's large patch. And he didn't believe me. I was like, okay, I, I'll tell you what, I'll send it to our turf specialist in Kyle Station. Boom, send it to her. She said large patch. I should have bet money on it, but I didn't. Um, it, it, what it was is a micro environment. It was underneath those oak trees and there was just uh, trap moisture and, and stuff like that that was a problem. So <clears throat> uh, anyway, you know, 50 hour, a lot of humidity, the cooler days, that's when that large patch will show up. And like I said, you know, like right now, we just had that little cool front that kind of came through and there were some areas where we dropped below 70 here in our area. So there's a couple areas that may have shown or are exhibiting a little large patch. <laughs> Basically, the fungus will go away when the when everything disappears. It means there's a change in the environment, um, you know, or a change in the amount of water. So make sure you're monitoring those things. And of course, when we start to get those cold fronts, it's time to really just start backing off on the water as much as 75% at some point, um, or just once a week. Um, mainly uh, happens in the fall, can happen in the spring, can happen basically all winter in those mild winters like this last year. So uh, like I said, fungicides typically need to be applied prior to symptoms. So I always tell people who have had issues with it in the past, we make recommendations that they go out and they apply uh, a little bit before, um, you know, we get a cold front. So that fungicide is there to act as a preventative. Um, the, so, you know, get rid of low lying areas, decrease your watering. So, and then, like I said, there, you know, there's some of the things there, you know, Zoxystrobin, Michael Butanol, PCNB, some of those are really good. Macanzeb, you know, they're fair, but um, the ones that are good to excellent, excellent are there. But you know, look at the interval days, 14 to 28 days. So you you can't spray within that time frame. So you need to look at those things and make sure that you're not over applying fungicides because they can, in a sense, damage grasses too. Weeds. Well, I found a treasure. I always say one man's weed and another man's treasure. Um, four leaf clovers do exist. <clears throat> so weeds typically, um, you know, it's a lot of people want to eradicate and get rid of weeds immediately. Um, uh, somebody asked the question, when should I decrease watering this fall? Um, I well, once the temperatures drop down and typically that's somewhere about October 1st, October 15th, just depends on the year. Um, OK, so weed control is typically a program. Don't you're never going to you're never going to get full eradication. Uh, the object. The other part of that is why are you treating for weeds if you don't have any? Um, or you can take my approach that weeds are good. They're green. Um, if you keep a mode, nobody knows the difference. Um, so that that's the other aspect. And, and that kind of has a two edged sword to it. You know, <clears throat> mowing often, uh, especially during the spring and the summer months, you're cutting the seed heads, you're keeping them from seeding and you're getting those seed heads off of there. Now, and I'll tell you a little big, you know, little thing about um, turf grass. I've, I actually trained my two kids to pull the seed heads off the, the grass weeds. Like uh, we have Bahia grass up here. They actually go up and snap the seed heads off and then throw them in the trash. So 
I guess it's my form of torture over the years, but when my 18 year old went out and mowed the front lawn and he still did it, he was he was definitely helping my lawn because I wasn't spreading all those seeds back into my lawn to you know cause more competition between my turf grass. So there's really no such thing as eradication. There's just management. <clears throat> and there's no selective herbicide out there that will control Bermuda grass in a St. Augustine lawn uh, and vice versa. Uh, you know, it, it's a it's a pain to do it, but the fact is, is you know, I had my brother call me years ago, and he was complaining about all the weeds he had in his lawn, and I said, brother, if, I said, if you would just mow your lawn more often, nobody would ever see it or know the difference. In fact, I challenge people sometimes if they would mow their lawn, drive around the block and drive by your house like it's not yours, you can't see it. Uh, sometimes we tend to micromanage a little too much, <clears throat> but there are some weeds that can be potential problems. Um, Pre-emergence, um, one of the things I'll discuss, we do not recommend a lot of these weed and feed products because the timing of application for pre-emergence versus actual fertilization. The only time we get close to having that is here in the, the fall time frame where we can potentially uh, utilize a weed and feed products, but we still don't utilize that, especially in our area because we have so many trees and a lot of these products can damage or harm trees. And you'll see on labels of these products, it'll say, you know, don't put around oak trees or, you know, be careful of putting around trees. So you got to be careful about things like that. Uh, corn gluten meal. Uh, one of my cohorts, uh, Skip Richter, who you've probably seen on these programs, uh, did some studies with that. Um, you know, organic treatments have to be applied regularly and uh, they can also sometimes cause other issues. So you have to be careful with some of the things that are out there. Uh, they're probably not as effective or maybe just a little eff effective as far as that's concerned. Uh, so uh, actually, thank you, Ginger, you popped that one up there for me. Uh, this is actually comes out of that publication. Um, you can see the different types of products are there, the different types of grasses and everything that they, uh, if, if they do grasses and broadleaves or just grasses. So you kind of have to pick your poison when it comes to, pun intended, pick your poison when it comes to doing pre-emergence. If you've had really bad problems with certain weeds, um, then that would be the way to go. Um, the problem is some of these weeds are not, um, yeah, I'll talk about buttonweed. That's one of my favorites, definitely. Uh, some of these products are not gonna control, especially things like buttonweed, uh, Somebody have a question? Or, okay. The uh, yeah, some uh, okay. So some of these products are not going to control buttonweed because buttonweed, Virginia buttonweed, spreads in a lot of different ways. Um, it, it just pre-emergent alone is not going to do it. The when you mow over it and you cut it up into pieces, those pieces can become new plants. Um, you know, I hate to say it, but sometimes it's best just to to pull it out the best you can. And, and minimize the the travel of it. And in fact, that's uh, you know I didn't have it in my front yard uh, the last couple of years, but now I'm starting to see a little bit here and there. So I just go out and I pull it. I try to get it out of there and get it off so it doesn't spread as as readily. Um, the biggest thing is though, uh, Virginia buttonweed, especially. Um, what does Virginia buttonweed look like? Okay, um, I'll I'll get to that. The um, so the biggest thing is is with with Virginia buttonweed, you got to get control over it. It typically likes moist areas or moisture, so you got to be careful. Uh, there's some products out there, uh, weed free zone, speed zone, uh, that are for post emerge, uh, but you have to be careful with those because you can't spray them when they're the temperatures are above about 85 degrees, 88 degrees. So they they be some of those chemicals actually become hot. So make sure you read the directions on the labels. Um, met sulfuron methyl, uh, MSM. What about using MSM? Yes, MS, MSM does work too. Um, MSM turf is one of them, I think. Yeah, in fact, it is. So met sulfuron methyl does. You know, I I typically like to do uh, or recommend spot treatments rather than whole yards. It's just easier as far as because this is a weed that's going to keep coming back. It's just it's going to save you a little money to do it that way. There you go. Thanks, Boone. Appreciate it. 
So, um, so your pre-emergence are not going to help when it comes to these types of weeds. Um, indicators, you know, indicator weeds, whenever I see Virginia buttonweed, whenever I see, uh, 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 what is the other one? The, uh, the one that's the shade, uh, bamboo, uh, wavy bamboo, or wavy basket, excuse me, sorry, wavy basket grass. That's another one. That's an indicator that there's too much shade. Uh, those types of things. In fact, that one, the only thing you can really do is spray like glyphosate, like a kill all product on it. Uh, and then, of course, reduce your you, reduce your shade area, the shade area in that, that area. Um, reduce your water, reduce your fertilization, more sunlight, maybe even plant new grass. Um, but yeah, Virginia buttonweed is one of those that we have a big problem with in our area. Uh, MSM turf will do it. Uh, blind side is one of those that I've had my gentleman using uh, up here in this area. He used it all throughout the summer. Uh, I'll tell you one key to one key to getting a grip on Virginia buttonweed is to treat it early. When the plants are the youngest, that's when they're most susceptible. So when you're looking into you know April May is when they start to germinate and come out. That's and when you can learn to identify and know that's when they start uh, treating them at that point in time is when they're going to be most susceptible and they're going to be uh, hurt more severely by the products that are out there. <clears throat> so getting rid of sticker burrs, I'll be honest with you, sticker burrs is hard. Uh, water hyssop, um, yeah, you need to control the amount of water you have. <laughs> um, let's go back to sticker burrs. Sticker burrs image, uh, which has uh, a mazaquin in it. Uh, it does do a good job of, of, of controlling some of the sticker burrs. You just got to get them early before they actually put out the burrs. Uh, a mazaquin is the active ingredient. Uh, just make sure it is any of the products you use uh, are labeled for your specific type of turf grass because there are some that uh, will damage um, St. Augustine or because it's you know or bermuda so you got to be careful with that but um the whole thing is if you have sticker burrs and it's in a lawn typically the best thing to do is before they learn how to identify them while they're young and pull them get them out of the grass once they put that that seed head out with those sticker burrs that's just multiple generations and they take three to five years to germinate so um i know when i lived up in, in down in south texas and corpus I would go in every day and watch the kids when they'd play and I'd sit in an area and I'd just start kind of pulling them out and eventually just uh, it just eradicated them. So um, and then once the grass gets healthy, it'll help it. So um, most of these like this, um, so your your pre-emergence are, are, are good about now. The problem is, is that if you apply now, you're probably going to have to apply again in about six weeks. I would do like a half strength application and then another one a little later just so you can account for weather patterns uh, when weather patterns change you might miss some weeds the, you know the other thing to consider sometimes is just removing them by hand um, it, it's just you know some weeds are just it's much more cost effective number one uh, but because of the way they grow it's more effective to to just physically remove them um, here's also a table from that publication as well Kind of tells you the tolerances of uh, some of the active ingredients in the products. Um, you know, it, it like I said, a magic a mazaquin is one of those that will help as far as uh, your your sticker burrs, uh, sedges. Uh, you know, uh, nut sedges and turf grass. I, I almost sometimes wish they could make a nut sedge that would be a grass. That it would maybe be a good thing, um, <laughs> but it I would be in a lot of trouble for it. So, um, OK, so let's talk about insects. I kind of want to move along here. Uh, healthy lawns, best defense uh, when it comes to both you know, your insects and your weeds, of course, uh, doing all those processes properly, uh, you know, removal, any kind of treatments, uh, you know, pre-emergence, post-emergence. You know, with a combination of those things, you can at least reduce the amount of weeds that you have in your lawn. But like I said, if you don't have the weeds or if they're really not bad weeds, why put out some products that you really don't need to? Uh, eventually, you know, most of the time, the St. Augustine grass and even Bermuda grass will choke out certain weeds. So sometimes just a healthy lawn is the best defense. So let's move into the uh, like right now we're starting to we had starting to have some 
I don't want to say early season, but late season chinch bug in a sense. Uh, we started to get a little flux up here and that cold front came in and kind of slowed them down a little bit, but we're still starting to, we're still getting back into the, the chinch bug issues. And, and typically it's just because grass is stressed from heat, uh, from lack of water, then they become more susceptible. Um, basically, it's, you remember kind of how we talked about take all patch, how uh, it suffocates the, the the system of nutrients and water. <clears throat> this insect does the same thing. It basically feeds and injects an enzyme in the grass that disrupts the flow of nutrients and water through the system, thus causing and basically shuts it off. It's, it's actually much faster dieback than uh, what you would see with um, uh, with the take all uh, take all root rot. So it you'll all of a sudden see a little spot and then it is dead and the next day it's bigger and the next day it's even bigger. So uh, you'd have to go out there and you'd go inspect that. Uh, typically those uh, chinch bugs prefer like a dry sunny area, hot next to concrete first, and then they kind of move out beyond that. And, and just depending on how many there are. <laughs> so as you can see, that's a dime right there. They're pretty darn small. Um, I always like to say that, uh, that uh, the adults especially have like a acme bomb on the back of their back. It's a white looking uh, a bomb looking thing, but you can see right there in the picture to the left how it's very, uh, very, very evident between dead and green. Now, where those insects are are already in the green uh, area, so that's where you would inspect uh, and how you would do that would be, you know, place a tin can in there and uh, haul it out tin can or you can use soapy water and they would come running out to the top and you can see too uh, on that dime there's a little bitty one up at the top on the hair of the the coin there uh, it's almost like an orangey rusty color so that's the the juveniles and as they kind of go through each stage so um, here's a little video that will kind of show you I uh, had a lady come in and she <laughs> told me many times how she did not have chinch bugs and when I asked her what they looked like, she didn't know. And, and I was just, you know, I'm just, our job is to educate. And she said, I don't have chinch bugs. I said, okay. I said, but this is an indication of chinch bugs. So I got down and I said, oh, let me record this because this is going to be fun. So you can see there uh, kind of about mid screen on the left, you see a little Acme white bomb. Uh, you saw, of course, a little spider move across the system. And then right there kind of a little bit towards the middle of the left, there's like a little orange dot. That's one of the juveniles. And this was only just a one little bitty area. She actually brought in about a 10, 10 inch by 10 inch piece uh, and it was just crawling. Um, I've had gentlemen bring in their turf grass and say, what's wrong with my turf? And they open up the shoe box and chinch bugs come flowing out. So uh, it's something, you know, that, that can still be a little bit of an issue this time of year um, as far as treatments are concerned. Um, you know, here's the way to identify them. And of course, finding a, a, an actual tin coffee can nowadays is kind of hard, but if you just use a soapy water solution, or if you have great eyesight, you can get down there in those areas and kind of filter through the, to the bottom of the grass right there where the, your leaf material uh, might be, your thatch areas. Um, you'll be able to see them running around. Just look for the different generations. Um, and then, of course, the biggest thing is that they spread so fast. They can basically do three to six generations over small, you know, over a short period of time. So you have to be careful. Uh, the best thing to do is just get on them pretty quick. Uh, Bifenthrin, um, I forgot, you know, Scott's Ortho brands, Cyfluthrin, Bear brands as well. I think Scott's as well. There's a Lambda Cyhalothrins, uh, permethrins, those are all good active ingredients for those. Typically, you want to do a spray. Uh, I fortunately have a I had a spot a couple of years ago pop up in my yard and I have some old diazinon. Uh, it took one treatment to knock them out because I caught them early enough, but typically it's going to take more than one treatment to make sure that you get um, not only the adults, but also the next generations that are coming up from the uh, from the uh, from eggs. <clears throat> Going to sod webworms. Uh, this is something that's been popping up a lot lately, and um, it's it's typically cyclical. It happens about every couple of years. Um, 
we've been having I've been getting. In fact, I think I probably got about 15 or 20 emails right now with various different conditions with turf grass in my email box. Um, but these little guys, you'll be walking through your grass and you'll see these adults uh, on the left there fly up out of the turf. Uh, also, they'll be in the bushes or in the ground cover next to the turf. And what you'll notice if you look close enough, you'll see right there next to that moth, there's a good bite out mark right there on that left leaf blade where they've actually, the larva have chewed that. Um, and Boone just posted the uh, publication for that. Um, it, it's got good recommendations in it. And there was a good research paper one of our agents just sent us not too long ago about it. But there you can see the larva on the right hand side. The, they are kind of difficult to control because of when they feed and how they feed and how they hide. <clears throat> So they come up and they chew leaves. They typically do that late in the evening or at nighttime. Um, and so the adults will go hide in the bushes or the ground cover and the worm is in there eating and chewing up things. So you actually have the appearance sometimes when they get a large number of them where it looks like an area is actually actually been mowed versus an area that that's been non mowed because um, they will chew up leaves pretty quick when they get in high numbers. <clears throat> so Here's a little video of uh, what one looks like and where it's hiding. What I did is I, I just kind of poked him real quick right after I turned on my camera. He was hidden down in there where you really couldn't see him. I lifted some of the leaf blades up and I was able to see him. Uh, so I just snapped a quick video of him. Um, but here's some of the, the treatment options that are available. Uh, make sure you spray in the evening for these. You may also want to treat your shrubbery or, or, or a ground cover that's close by where you've seen some of the adults uh, just to kind of knock the population down. Uh, like, and, and there's some of the, the brands and brand names and everything that have those active ingredients in it. Uh, typically, these are <clears throat> you know, uh, these are spray on. They're not um, not going to be granular. Uh, granulars don't seem to work as well just because of where they're located. They're not on the soil. They're actually in the crevices of the grass up off the soil. Um, so, you know, with chinch bugs, a granular would, might be okay because they're in there working across that. Uh, but uh, typically uh, with both these insects, a, a spray would be a little bit more beneficial to use. <clears throat> just spray in the evening. And then, and there, of course, there is the alternative using a Bacillus thuringiensis, either as a Y or a Christaki, either one of those. Uh, and, and basically, just remember with any kind of uh, natural or organic treatment, it needs to be upkept as far as treatment. Uh, it washes off with rain and also gets broken down by sunlight. So it has to be reapplied about every five to seven days. If unless you get rain, then you'd have to apply it shortly thereafter. <clears throat> so the, the whole deal with BT uh, Bacillus thuringiensis is that once it's ingested by the insect, it basically gives them heartburn. They'll never forget. <clears throat> so, um, like I said, you know, keep good. Kind of if you can, you know, keep an idea of, you know, what you're doing and when you're doing it. Sometimes you can make adjustments by just seeing what you're uh, what you're your, your schedule is as far as your lawn. Uh, my friend up there that, that I've been dealing with for a couple of years, he, he, he you can see kind of, uh, uh, you know, he's got uh, a whole bunch of different things that he's got listed when he's done things. Um, he's uh, He has when to call me, uh, like on that post-emerge product, he says, see with Michael. So he calls me and asks me or sends me an email and asks me what he should do, when he should do it. And so he's He's basically getting a format down to where it helps him manage his lawn better and more efficiently. <clears throat> so that's something to think about. You know, he just used a spreadsheet to do that. Um, this actually happened in my neighborhood. Um, a gentleman went to the store. He wanted to put a weed and feed out. He was so upset because he put this on a St. Augustine. The fact is, is he just didn't read the label or even maybe the worker did not know what was going on. But he said, yeah, that'll work. When the fact is, is it it was not for his lawn. Um, it killed his St. Augustine. It was meant for Bermuda grass. So, you know, that that's kind of why, too, we, we don't like to do these things. And and not only that, it was it was the wrong time of year to do it. So it just added insult to injury uh, when it came to that. 
Um, but here's some resources. Like I said, I'll be sending you some uh, this uh, through email, uh, my presentation. Um, you got those kind of things. And if you go to the actual um, website, uh, you can, uh, let's see here. You can look at, here's the publications uh, that are through aggieturf.tamu.edu. That's where Ginger and um, Boone have been kind of posting from. They've been grabbing those publications, but they're all right there. They got some quick guides in there. Insect control, weed control, diseases, lawn management uh, guides for both your Bermuda grass and your St. Augustine. <clears throat> so good information there to help you um, as far as uh, get that out. So um, all right, let me go back to. OK. I like how it pulls up a whole bunch of stuff that you don't need. So here's those resources right there. And also don't forget that we have other classes coming up. Um, of course, I'm doing the one this today. Next week, we got Herbs for the Coastal Garden uh, by Kevin Gibbs. Uh, he'll be doing that one. And uh, they all start at 10 a.m. Make sure you register for them and everything. And then we got citrus coming in uh, later in the month as well. So that'll be a good one. But uh, yeah, if you have any questions, just let us know. I hope you enjoyed today. And let's go ahead and see if we can handle some questions, I guess. <laughs> great, great presentation, Michael. The first one that uh, I think probably people are dealing with more is this is torpedo grass uh, encroachment. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. I have luckily I have direct experience with that. Uh, my mother-in-law's lawn is a St. Augustine lawn. Um, they planted some shrubbery in there and they uh, brought in some torpedo grass. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, the only thing she can do to get it out uh, is to go to like a zoysia grass. There are actually products that that can be used on zoysia grass that won't affect the grass to er eradicate it. Otherwise, what you have to do is you have to spot spray um, a, I mean, and, and just isolate the area the best you can and just spray it with a kill all and, and keep spraying it and killing it until it goes away. Um, and it's just because, you know, you can have, uh, you can have the, the actual runners of those, they're five, six inches down in the ground. So if you pull it, if you're not pulling up that runner that runs across, uh, it's almost impossible to control it. So uh, in a St. Augustine lawn, very difficult to control. But if you keep it mowed, <laughs> it actually doesn't, doesn't make that bad of a grass. Now, if you have just isolated um, sprouts coming up, uh, you know, like I said, just, you know, quick spray of something that'll be um, the uh, you know a quick spray of something that's coming out uh, of a kill all clean uh, kill all type product. So um, I saw somebody said about Dallas grass. Dallas grass is one of those that's also difficult to control. Um, in fact, there's just not a lot of things that that actually do much good on it except for just a kill all type product that has glyphosate in it with spot treatments or digging it up. Hmm. We had a question in here about organic fertilizers, um, uh, referencing microlife, but just in general, uh, any differences between um, the conventional and organic lawn fertilizers? Um, the only time I, you know, the whole thing is like in our area, since we're so fungal prone, I guess, uh, I typically will recommend switching to more organic or natural uh, fertilizers just because it, they're not going to add fuel to the fire when it comes to uh, it comes to some of the fungal issues. So the best thing to do, yeah, there's a whole bunch of them, not only micro life, but there's ladybug formulas. You can also top dress with, you know, a thin layer of compost and other things like that. Um, all those products are really good. In fact, I just saw something a little different yesterday because, you know, it's hard to keep up with products and things that are going on, but the micro life has a has one that's supposed to help with um, uh, fungal issues. It's it's a little bit different formulation. 
<clears throat> but um, yes, those are good products. Slow release, they release over time, which makes it more viable. Just depending on the area too, so. Michael, you had referenced in the beginning, you had a, um, a little turf to-do list or a lawn chore list. If I give people your email address, if you have a, a, a side document that you use, would you mind sending that out to some folks? I can, or they can go to the aggieturf.tamu.edu and go to the publications part of that. There, They actually have a, I'm going to try to do this real quick. They have actually, I'll pop it open. Hold on one second. So, can you see my screen? Okay, so yep. down yeah. here under lawn management, right down here, they have these calendars. The St. Augustine management calendar and Bermuda home lawn management calendar. Now, if you live in my, my county, I'll be more than happy to share that with you. Uh, my email address is mpotter, M-P-O-T-T-E-R, at ag.tamu. Dot edu and i will be more than happy to share that with people and um yeah it'd be easier that way just in case you're from a different area the timing would be a little bit different or off so just remember that the general one that's on the website you know it's going to accommodate for a large part of texas and so it would change just depending on your local area Michael, uh, unless Ginger is seeing anything that I don't, we've uh, I think we've addressed all the comments and questions in the in the thread. So it looks like we're good to go. Yep. The question here right at the end was is from Linda and and, and equally for others is that as soon as this video is edited, it will be uploaded to our YouTube page for Gardening on the Gulf Coast, but you will also get a, a follow up email from Michael uh, with a link to uh, directly to that recording. And as well, we'll have a, a short, very short uh, evaluation, online eval evaluation instrument um, that uh, we would appreciate just probably two minutes of your time to go ahead and fill that out. And that will help us guide our programs in the future. Okay, um, somebody's asking, uh, I saw one that said, I missed how to manage day flower in the lawns. Um, actually, it, it kind of falls in the same category as um, the wavy basket grass. It is a difficult weed to manage, period. And typically those, the day flower is that likes shady areas or moist areas. So you have to manage those areas a little differently. You decrease your watering um, and, and somehow potentially add a little you know get some more sunlight in those areas otherwise the only thing really that 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 can be used um, to control or at least eliminate it uh, would more than likely be um, you know pulling it out the best you can getting a you know getting knocking it back in a sense by pulling it out um, but using maybe uh, I think they said the atrazine type uh, active ingredient or a maziquin or simazine, those three would be uh, good controls to to spray on top of them. And of course, glyphosate uh, would work as well. But you got to be careful with you know if you don't try not to damage the rest of your turf with doing those kind of applications. 